Dr. Forsberg, thank you for that introduction and for your invitation to be here today to make a presentation on St. Francis of Assisi. It's wonderful to see so many colleagues, uh, several former students, many friends, and uh, new friends whom I'll be making today as we have a chance to talk after this event. Um, St. Francis of Assisi is such a, a, a major and massive topic that one has to approach it with a certain focus. Um, the important date to remember in any consideration of St. Francis in art is the year of his death in 1226 because it becomes a reference point forward into his back into his life and forward. And I mention that because the first painted image that we have of St. Francis of Fresco was probably done two years before his death. We know this because it has no halo and certainly no sign of the stigmata and it's a very valued image but in a location where very, very few people get to see it. The next major manifestation on St. Francis is a major altarpiece done nine years after his death in 1235. And then after that, of course, the great cycle in the upper church at Assisi, that basilica having been built to hold his body and become a place of pilgrimage. That cycle uh, of 28 frescoes in the upper church is, of course, the most complete and in many ways the most satisfying development of his life and his ministry. It is to this day the largest uh, uh, fresco cycle in all of Italian art. But what often happens, and then just a few years after that, Giotto himself in Santa Croce, the great large Franciscan church in Florence, was commissioned by the Bardi family, the Bardi banking family, to do a smaller cycle in their chapel, what is known as the Bardi Chapel, just a little after 1300. The result is that most attention to art in, on St. Francis ends somewhere around the Bardi Chapel simply because there is so much to look at, because it is so rich in detail and also in, in craftsmanship in the artistic quality of it, that very little attention is given to the art afterwards. This is not true only in presentations such as this, but even in books on St. Francis, and I have to say on the attention of scholars, most of whom are naturally drawn to this early work. So today we're going to look at three artists who did cycles on St. Francis after Giotto. I thought maybe a good title would be St. Francis after Giotto, but we're going to be looking at three Italian masters recognized, developed Italian masters, independent of their work on St. Francis in the 1400s in Italy, and the first is Sassetta. Sassetta's real name is Stefano di Giovanni, and you see the dates of his life, which means he basically occupied the first half of the 1400s. We have no idea, many of these nicknames for these artists came from some aspect of their life, and we have no idea why he was called Sassetta. Uh, but established himself independent of his work on St. Francis as a really major artist. We're going to look at the church of San Francesco uh, in the town of Borgo San Sepolcro. Um, one of the things to mention is that the Franciscans were relentless in seeing that their churches were frescoed and painted in different ways by the best artists of the time. Through St. Francis and his incarnational sense of God found in creation, in reality, art was a very valued form of spiritual communication. And the Franciscans picked this up very early, and so not only in the great upper church at Assisi, but any church that they uh, had, uh, where possible they had, if not an altar panel, uh, frescoes done. By comparison, the Dominicans, St. Dominic's life is almost contemporaneous, had next to no interest in uh, decorating their churches with the life of St. Dominic. Not to say that they were against art, but they didn't have that sense that the Franciscans uniquely brought to uh, uh, having art be one of the means of not only communication of the history of Francis, but evoking spiritual uh, development. So it's a Franciscan church, Borgo San Sepolcro. We just point out that this is the town of Piero della Francesca. And when we look at these frescoes, the young Piero della Francesca would have surely been in the pews of that church looking at the work of um, uh, Stefano di Giovanni, even though his style developed very differently. We call this 
the San Sepulcro altarpiece, and its date is 1444. Now, just a word about what an altarpiece would be. While in some cases um, the walls were frescoed, very often a wooden panel would be prepared to be put behind the altar. It would be covered in a layer of a kind of form of plaster or gesso, and the artist would paint upon it. It probably had larger scenes and then individual small panels. And the reason is that by this time, because of the Fourth Lateran Council conducted in the time of St. Francis, Mass was now being said with the priest back to the people. And w when people attended Mass, they really had nothing to look at except the back of the priest. The Mass was said in Latin, and most people didn't know it. And in addition, in the absence of amplification, even those who did couldn't hear very much. So the altar piece, or the altar panel, loomed high above the way this would, if I were facing it, they had a work of art to look at, something to draw their attention and to invite spiritual reflection. And that's basically what the altar panel was. Some of these altar panels have survived intact, and others were later replaced to be replaced by something of a different style. And that's what happened to this altar panel. After 150 years, the friars there decided they wanted something else, and this altar panel was removed, and as often happened, it was disassembled. And some pieces were given away, some were sold, and the majority of them disappeared. So we see them in small sections in museums, but we don't really um, see them in their totality. So we're going to look at several of the different pieces, but we, we, first of all, we, we can't imagine even what the entire altar panel was like. But we have a very good sense from those that have survived. And here's the first one. Now this is the scene of the uh, famous moment of Francis where he decides to renounce publicly his worldly goods so as to devote himself to a life of freedom in poverty to serve them, be with and to serve the most marginalized. Those familiar with the art which has gone before, this is a visual shock. It's not like anything that had preceded. So what we need to do in order for this to have any meaning is to go for just a moment to the great cycle before that at Santa Croce in Florence, the great Franciscan church, and to go into the Bardi chapel, the banking Bardi family, whose chapel was given pride of place just to the right of the sanctuary and the main altar, where they decided to devote it to St. Francis, Franciscan church, and hired Giotto to create a small number of frescoes for that chapel. And I want to show just one, because we need to see this to have a context as to what a, a, a shock, visual shock in a sense, the Seseta uh, frescoes are. This is the same scene. It's the moment when Francis, who had been undergoing a deeper and deeper spiritual conversion, came to the moment that he was ready to renounce his future financially and live a radical poverty so as to be free to spend his time and service to the most impoverished and the most marginalized. And it's depicted very dramatically, you see, on the right, with Francis, who has literally dropped all his clothing, taken off all his clothing, and become literally and symbolically nude before God. So we see that gesture here. And interestingly, first of all, for decorum, the bishop covers his nudity with his garment. But obviously in doing that, he also indicates his approval of this beginning of a, of a way of life. This is not the beginning of the Franciscan order, but a first step. By the way, this is the historical Bishop Guido, who was not only there for that event, but throughout Francis's life and lived two years beyond him. So Bishop Guido, a historical figure, figures very prominently in the stories of St. Francis. It's a dramatic moment. And you see, Francis is looking up to God. He's made a decision, okay? And then you see some of the people here supporting him. His dropping of the clothing, and the clothing is not on the ground. This is his father who has taken the clothing, all right? Represented everything. Because Francis came from what we would call today an upper middle class family, but there was no such category. We might say then an upper mercantile family. His father imported fabric from the East. And they were very comfortable, and they did very well. Uh, and this was his future. He was already, to some degree, helping his father with the business. But this, the cloth, represented security, reasonable comfort. And to drop it 
is not only to give up the clothing he's wearing, but to say, I'm abandoning that security. I want to live in radical uncertainty and poverty. So the artist has dramatically depicted this in this moment. And here's the other world. Here's the father holding the clothing. But the father is so, have to understand, we talk about a generation gap. The father cannot understand how his son would give up everything, the whole future, the family business. The issue here is vision. In fact, his vision is looking toward God, and this is a different vision. It's a vision of acquisition, of gathering stuff. It's an acquisition. His father's well-intentioned, but he cannot see the world through the eyes that Francis has. And so at this moment, he's so angry, he wants to lunge at him and hit, strike him. And he's being held back, actually, by one of his accomplices. So we see the garment, beautifully dramatic. And what we see is brilliantly what Jondo does is to take a building and put them at the corner so you have, in a sense, the one world at this point, the other world at that point, and the building kind of projecting into the space. But always the space, because these are two worlds that will never meet. They will never touch. These are two visions that are looking somewhere else. Interestingly, too, is typical, and this is a term, the naturalism, which Giotto is advancing. And just take a look at the figure of the, of the father, that he occupies space. If you understood or uh, know earlier Italo-Byzantine art, the figure is, we'd say, sculptural. It holds its space. The garment is well developed. The light and shadows play off it. We have a kind of reality of light and shadow, of garment, of the, the, the uh, physical, the face and the elements, and of space. Now today we would say what looks very realistic, but that's a term we don't really use. Realism is a term that emerged in the late, in the 19th century, mid 19th century in France. We say it's naturalism. The light is beginning to look like real light and the space is more comprehensible as space. The figures occupy their space. We say of them that they're sculptural, but not in a critical way in the sense they look like statues. This naturalism had begun, but Giotto brings it to a new level. And really, this is why some critics later called Giotto the father of painting in the Western art, which is a, 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 the father of painting in the Western world. It's quite a title to give someone. But because it's seen that he advanced Western painting in a direction, which Oriental painting doesn't take, which would lead to the high Renaissance. And some would say, in a sense, the Renaissance is beginning very early. This is not medieval painting. But the reason I show you this is that when Saseta comes along, and we, we, need, we need that image. It's totally different. There's nothing naturalistic about this. And what's fascinating about this first great series on Francis after Giotto is that, Giotto, that Saseta does not feel the need to advance the naturalism, which is the predominant movement of art now, certainly in Italy and certainly in Florence. First of all, he's from Siena. And Siena uh, always considered itself just a little more proper and a little more refined than Florence. For the Sienese, Florence was a rough and tumble city, something like a modern New York. But in Siena, they were refined. And their art was always linear and elegant. And he has no intention of giving up his roots. And he's hired by the Franciscans, and he takes a different vision. And I think that's the most important point about this image. Because very often we tend to think about Western art as just a gradual, like a rocket taking off an ascension that's going toward greater and greater naturalism, and nothing could be further from the truth, because the artist brings his personal vision. And don't you think, when this was looked at, how fresh and new this was, a new, the same story, but a new way of seeing something very, very different. So what we see, for example, is the, the figures are gracious and elegant. They're, they almost look like they're all of a chivalry, or the world of chivalry. And the whole thing almost looks like an illustration in a story of the chivalry of, of knights and uh, highly elegant people, which would not relate to the life of St. Francis. But it's a different vision. So for example, the father's garment, look at how it spills down beautifully. And Francis here, uh, being how you certainly have the space between them, he almost looks like a waif, almost somewhat feminine, weak. But that's the way, in that elegance, he decided to depict them. What we see first are the colors. Where in, in Western art did we ever see colors like this? Where have we seen anywhere greens like this? Or pinks that really today we would say is a hot 
pink. This, this is what we're looking at. His colors are absolutely unique. And then just the multiplicity of arches and spaces that you could, you could ignore the story and just enter into the, the magnificent spaces and then occasionally a figure in the background. It's gorgeous. It's beautiful. It's visually entertaining. And this is what he wants to do. It's a completely different vision. But two things. This playfulness, if you will, I think the word I would bring to it most is that it's charming. There's nothing charming about Giotto's work, but it's charming. And there's nothing wrong with religious art being charming or delightful to look at. But one mustn't have the idea that he any less respects the story. It's just a different vocabulary. Because when we look at this, after we luxuriate in all the different details, we're still left with this very powerful image of the abandoned clothing in the space between them. He has given everything up. It's on the floor. It's garbage for him. And he has entered into another world. And those two worlds are really, really quite different. This is a very powerful image. By the way, I would take questions at the end. I hope to end the timely so that we can have either comments or questions. In addition to scenes, uh, there are three major biographies artists drew upon. Thomas of Chilano wrote two of them. Thomas of Chilano was one of the most early companions of St. Francis and an eyewitness to everything. When Francis died at the request of the Pope, he wrote, with dec uh, 20 years apart, two biographies of Francis. And then in 1250, St. Bonaventure wrote the definitive biography called the Legenda Mayor. So those are bi biographies that are drawn upon. People began to think after his death that the order and other religious orders had the vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience. And that fascinated them, all right? That these commitments to live in radical poverty, to live a celibate life, and to be obedient to the superior of the order, and then to the bishop and to the larger church. So in one of these stories, we have, as if they were medieval ladies, we have Lady uh, Chastity in white, Lady Obedience in red, and in the middle, Lady Poverty in her Franciscan brown. And in this scene, Francis is wedding her. It's, it's a spiritual wedding. He took a, a personal relationship to each, but particularly to Lady Poverty. And this friar accompanying him may well be, in a sense, witnessing the marriage. An interesting concept, all right, to show that idea, particularly to his commitment to poverty. We could just mention, without going in great detail, that from the Benedictines on, the religious orders out of our poverty. But poverty didn't rule out the order owning land so they could have the monastery, or cows so that they could have milk and cheese. Francis's poverty was to be to have nothing and to depend on begging totally. And it developed that there were debates within the order whether this was feasible if they were going to grow. So you see why it's poverty that they focus upon because his poverty was to be radical, to have nothing, and to pe depend every day for himself and for the order on that. But what's delightful in this scene is that after this mystical wedding, the three of them sort of just float off into heaven, into the skies, and off they go. But if you look carefully, his bride, Lady Poverty, looks back longingly at him because they have a special relationship. All right? So in the middle, Poverty looks back. What's interesting too, I mean, the figures are elegant and they're charming and they're gracious. He works a little cityscape over there. But not to be missed is that in the larger background, with the hills and the sky and the setting sun, he exercises the very best techniques of the developing high renaissance. And in fact, what happened is his skill, this would be very understandable to his f f colleagues in Siena who painted this way. But what he was able to do with the landscape helped to inspire them to bring the Sienese Renaissance closer to that of the Florentine. So there are a lot of things happening here that some artists only had eyes for. And you have to look and say, certainly, look at those mountains. You can just see the space behind it, the way they stand out. Okay? And by the way, remind you, this is all done on wooden panel. Another one of the stories that developed, and you'll often see this iconography, the Wolf, Wolf of Gubbio. Now, the town of Gubbio, the story was told that there was a wolf 
who menaced the people and was coming in at night and not only foraging for food but killing dogs and cats. Children were very vulnerable and sometimes even adults. Now there's a reality here. In these cities, and we try to imagine what was urban life like at this time, wolves were a problem. When they didn't get enough food, they came into these cities and they would indeed not only menace one's pets, but sometimes children were particularly vulnerable. So we see the reality of this the town of Gubios with this wall. Look at all the people, they're terrified of the wolf. They're all up there. That is an urban reality of urban life in 1444. So the story is told that this one wolf was unrelenting. And in the story, Francis becomes a peacemaker between the wolf and the town. So the populace is up here, but he has required some of the town fa fathers to gather here. And you see how he extends one hand to the wolf and the other to somebody who seems to be working out a treaty. And this is what the story says he did. He told the wolf, you've got to stop this. You have to start behaving because there's no way to treat them. But then he turned to the town fathers and said, and you have to feed the wolf. The wolf has a right to eat. And so he develops this charming little image, has a very important principle underneath it, and it's this. If you wish peace, there must be justice. And that's what it, they, that's so, this story, it's so, so interesting in these, these mythical stories, they hold a larger truth even if the original story isn't true. If the town wishes peace, it must exercise justice to the wolf. We see also another element of Francis as the peacemaker, as the negotiator, bringing peace where there is conflict. So it's a charming story, but one that if you were urban liver in 1444, might really be interested in. And of course, we have typical of him, the charming figure of the wolf, which is really, you can't imagine that wolf doing any harm. And these incredible colors that play here, just red, certain key points. But then this extraordinary hillscape, landscape, and clouds behind it. It, it, it absolutely amazing. And then, as typical of Saseta, something that should be disgusting, those are body parts, all right, of people have been dismembered by the wolf, but somehow they don't discuss this. It's rather charming and almost puts a smile on our face. And once again, Saseta says in the midst of this, it's all right to have a smile. It's all right to have a little bit of humor. It's all right to have a little bit of charm but a very serious point. Whenever I see this, I remember the fact that the first time a pope, reigning pope visited the United States, it was October 4th, 1965. Paul VI comes to New York and goes to the United Nations. It's October 4th, the, the Feast of St. Francis, and he goes to the United Nations and says, without justice, there can be no peace. And he plays directly on this Franciscan theme. At the center of this altar panel is this extraordinary image of St. Francis, one of the most extraordinary you will see anywhere, and an image you would not expect from the panels that we've seen. I want to show you first the detail of it, all right, of the mystical face of St. Francis. You wouldn't think stylistically from what we were looking at with its little forms and its charm that this would be the face that's depicted. Now, I want to go back and explain. This is extremely complex. What you have, and by the way, this is what you would want at the center, an image of St. Francis with the gold in the background so that when you were looking at it, reflecting either from the candlelight or from the sun coming in or the light through the windows, it would glow. And Francis would stand out from this. It's a magnificent image. This is not St. Francis in this life. This is not St. Francis in mystical prayer. This is St. Francis in eternity. The theologians try to help us. What, what might the beatific vision be like? What could it be? to behold the face of God. In the, in the Old Testament, the Jewish scriptures, it was impossible to behold God. One would die. You cannot see the face of God and live. In the beatific vision, what might it be? We have an attempt in art to suggest Francis beholding God. He's not looking out. He's looking up. He's in glory, St. Francis in glory. So we see this figure in God's presence. That's why he's in that Ammon shape that comes from Italo-Byzantine art, which we call the mandorla, usually reserved for Christ. But of course, he's an altar Christus, he's another Christ. All right, he's received the stigmata as a sign of how closely he's identified with Christ, so he's contained within it. What's interesting is we have three elements here. We have Renaissance elements, 
we have Italo-Byzantine elements and we have medieval elements. Certainly in the depiction of Francis with this extraordinary robe and figure, it's thoroughly Renaissance. And by the way, floating out um, it's mystically over this water, and we shouldn't ignore how well this is done, this, this seascape and then the uh, land beyond it. Up above, we have, uh, and certainly in uh, the mandorla, we have Italo-Byzantine art. Italo-Byzantine simply refers to the early Italian art that was influenced by the Byzantine Empire, the art that was being executed in what is Turkey today, which came, the art of the icon, which came onto Italian shore, and at the beginning marked the earliest manifestations of Italian art, which is being slowly uh, abandoned by artists like Giotto. But up at the top, we have wonderful medieval symbolism because we have here, once again, Lady uh, Chastity, Lady Obedience in red, holding the yoke. It may be hard to see, but Obedience is taking the yoke upon you, all right? And then we have his, his Lady Poverty in her Franciscan brown. And what I love is he's put some patches on her garment, all right? One of the interesting things in almost all, all Franciscan art is we never see patches on the habits. These monks would have probably had one habit for 20 years. Probably didn't get washed too often, and when it had a hole, it got patched. Everything is always so beautified. Art always idealizes in some way. Well, Lady Poverty has some of those Franciscan patches. So we have that element, okay? And then I'll come back in a moment, but I want to look at the face, this extraordinary face. The eyes already looking up at God, and we have uh, uh, carved into the gold, gold background his name, Franci Francisca St. Francis. But what's interesting is we have, even though it's a very, in some ways, Renaissance face, we have these traces of Italo-Byzantine art. I'm going to explain why. If you know the Italo-Byzantine icons and art, the skin, the face was always compartmentalized into geometric sections, the neck and particularly. Well, he doesn't do that here quite, but he does a little bit of it. And I think what he's trying to do is draw upon all three traditions. The Renaissance tradition he's practicing, the Italo-Byzantine tradition, which was the source of it all, and then the medieval from which they were emerging. But what he does is, for the compartmentalization, instead of the Italo-Byzantine did it in very rigid lines, straight lines, he does it in these wavy lines, which of course is the sign of Sienese art. The, the curve, that's, that's the mark. Remember we saw that first garment of the father spreading down. It's as if he is Sien, it made Sien and Siena style for Italo-Byzantine division of the face. And it's absolutely extraordinary the way it works. And of course it works because his head is going up and we're getting naturalistic wrinkles in the face. But the power of the eyes and the mystical experience. Now when we come back, the last thoroughly medieval these thoroughly medieval symbolic figures at the bottom, and there are three. Difficult to see, but under his feet is a wild-looking man with a beard, wild-eyed with a lion. He is wrath. Wrath is anger that feeds upon itself. It gets deeper and deeper. Wrath. On the left is a woman gazing into a mirror. Now, we could immediately think vanity. A woman gazing into a mirror has different meanings in religious art, but it could be vanity. Some scholars think it's lust because she's down below chastity or uh, chastity. But I would prefer to think of that as more general, self-absorption, a life that's focused on self. And then the third one, it may look like a religious sister, but it's not because there's no religious order known to dress in that way. Rather, it's a woman somewhat more mature in years. And what she's got is a press, and it's overflowing with her money. Bills and coins are spilling out. She's avarice. She's devoted that already long life to collecting stuff, and she's got it. She can't even hold it in the box. It's spilling out. So we have avarice, wrath, and I would say self-absorption. But what's fascinating here is think of the positive virtues. You might say, why pick those three out? Well, we saw Francis, the opposite of wrath, the man who tried to bring peace. We talked today of conflict resolution, who tried to make peace between two warring factions of the wolf and the town. Let there be peace rather than wrath. Self-absorption, if there was ever a life that wasn't self-absorbed, it was Francis. <laughs> 
For instance, his first movement was to the lepers, the most despised and feared in the society. And he said in his testament, written not long before he died, he more than anyone else in, in uh, Assisi dreaded being anywhere near the, the, the lepers, what, how difficult it was for him to go. Well, that's certainly a life that's the opposite of self-absorption. And finally, on the right, uh, acquisition, radical poverty, poverty to be free. It's a stunning, and that's just one element of it. So this is our introduction to a, a series that follows what Giotto did, and it's absolutely stunning. Scholars have tried to imagine what the other scenes were like. We really don't know, but what the ones we have, and I've only shown you a few, are quite extraordinary. The second I want to introduce is a series a little bit later by Benozzo Gozzoli. He lived between 1422 and 1497, so you see that he's just a little bit more mature um, than Sassetta in terms of moving through the 1400s. And we're going to go once again to the Church of St. Francis in the little town of Montefalco. And we're going to see now not an altar panel, but frescoes painted on the wall. And the date for this is 1452, just eight years later. This is the uh, sanctuary. We're going to be looking at these frescoes. You see that later a kind of a, an arch was created, a sort of a Renaissance altar screen, if you will, very different. And then the frescoes are painted right onto the wall. And in true fresco, it would mean a wet plastered wall where you paint the paint right in onto the wet plaster so that it seals in. It's not painted on it, dry fresco, but in it. Now, one thing we can be prepared for, the date and also the little architecture of the arches, we're going to see two things in these frescoes. Superb developing perspective and Renaissance architecture everywhere, all right? An architecture that didn't exist at the time of Francis. We're going to expect this to now really be high Renaissance vocabulary. We're coming to just about the period before Leonardo. But one other thing, because the space was small, he had a lot to tell. He crams his scenes into two and three together. And we're going to see them somewhat compacted. I love the first one most of all. So immediately, I don't need to comment on this superb Renaissance architecture, columns, pilasters, friezes, capitals, acanthus leaves, all of that. And the beautifully developed perspective in terms of interior space or the street space. Well, this is now this is not a follower of Sassetta. This is continuing the work of Giotto toward a greater naturalism. But the stories are absolutely fascinating because what we have now is the addition of new stories about St. Francis, not in the biography. One of the questions people began to ask almost 200 years later, how did Francis, how was he born? What was his birth like? So a legend develops that his mother, Pika, one day a pilgrim comes to her door and says, Hello, I've been sent to give you a message. You're going to bear a child. Well, we, no, there's no, no basis for this whatsoever. We see immediately the concept of the angel Gabriel announcing to Mary that she will bear the Christ child. We see a kind of a, a symbolism, all right? This is going to be a special child. So the pilgrim here comes to the door, and Pika, the mother, not yet mother, is told she will bear a child. We could spend so much time talking about how the architecture superbly leads us by the steps to the figure, how she's framed by the door, but not completely by the dark interior of the door and the balance of all of this. I mean, the eye can just get completely lost in the superb, not only architectural framing, but the spaces that are created. We move to the left, and now we see the birth of St. Francis. And what do we see? We see the birth of the, uh, the bath of the baby. Well, the bath of the baby by the midwives was one of the compelling scenes of nativity depictions until the time of Giotto. You almost always had this scene of the baby being taken from Mary by the midwives, that there were midwives there, we don't know that, and the baby is, is so around the time of Giotto, Giotto in the Scrovegni Chapel depicts that, and then we don't see that anymore. He's revived it because this is the second Christ receiving the bath from the midwives. And of course, what do we have? Suggesting the stable, we have the ass and the ox. Francis is an alter Christus. He is another Christ in the sense that his life so mirrored him. And then we have, now we really see it, a really older pika beyond normal childbearing age being comforted by one of the midwives. 
Now, this would not apply to Mary, but it would apply to Elizabeth, her cousin. Because if you remember in the scriptures, the birth of John the Baptist was miraculous because Elizabeth was beyond normal childbearing age. So we have a fascinating play of both um, St. Elizabeth and Mary. And what's the larger point? This child is special. That's the point. Specially provided for by God. Perhaps a little bit the way Jesus was. Perhaps a little bit the way Elizabeth is. But the specialness is completed on the right with a story often depicted in the art that preceded it. Here's a young Francis now walking down the street of Assisi with a friend. And we see, by the way, the Francis beautifully dressed, jaunty. Before his conversion, Francis was a poet. He wrote really what is the first poetry in the Italian language. He had gone into a, 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 an army expedition, a mercenary army for a year. He was an adventurer, a believer, but Francis liked the good life. And we see him here before that definitive moment walking down the street. But what is happening? This man, unknown man, has taken a garment and put it below his feet for him to walk upon. In the upper church at uh, Assisi, where this is depicted, they call this man the madman. What is he crazy, taking a beautiful garment and putting it in front of the feet of this, this young man walking down the street? Well, of course, there are associations of Christ, right, entering uh, Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, where the people took their clothes. But there's something more important. Why does he do it? He sees something special in this young man, who's just a young man like anyone else. He sees something special. So you see that the three scenes suggest that this life is to be something very special. What an incredible beginning for the narrative. We see another depiction of Francis renouncing his worldly goods. And you know, your variations on it. Here's Francis. Here's the space between him and his father. Just luxuriate visually in these garments, these ex the folds, the extraordinary folds of these garments, the play of light and shadows on them. But we can get lost in the technique. Nonetheless, we have the father holding his garments and the space between two worlds. And once again, Francis looking in a different way. Here the difference is that Bishop Guido has not covered him with a cloth, but with his own coat. He's gathered it around him to protect him. One's eye might be tempted to skip all that and simply delight in this incredible Renaissance combination, Renaissance medieval landscape. So you see, we have the same story set in a, a kind of a new vocabulary. These are stories well known, and they were in the upper church at Assisi. Once Francis made that radical move to give everything out, up and to start hanging out with the likes of lepers and beggars. At first, people in the town thought he was crazy, but not for very long. And we know that we have a Franciscan order today because very quickly, young men of equal comfort began to join him at first by the dozens and then by the hundreds. By the time Francis died, there were over 10,000 Franciscan friars, not to speak of the Clarissan nuns who also formed an order. It spread very quickly. At a certain point, when Francis had a group, they realized they had no plan that they should seek approval for the church and maybe become a religious order. So they had to go to the Pope. And the story develops, and it's, this is factual, because of people, how would this ragtag tag group ever get to meet the Pope to get approval? It was because of Bishop Guido. Bishop Guido, who had connections in the Vatican and got them to be able to meet Innocent III, unlikely as they must have been. They didn't have a habit that time ragtag group arrived and against all odds Guido gave he didn't form an order that day he gave them permission to d work toward developing a religious life but most importantly permission to go out and preach as lay people which was unheard of and the few times the Vatican had allowed it it created problems so Innocent III took a real risk why because he must have seen something special in him you see the fresco before that he must have seen something special because his decision, as depicted here, went against all rules of logic. So what we see in the art, and of course, art always has to beautify it. First of all, we see the scene here is not the way it was. They didn't have a habit. They weren't getting a habit at that point. They were getting approval just to continue. And approval to go out and preach as lay people. 12, 12, 12, unheard of. 
So it's kind of compacted here because later they did come back as an order to get a rule, and so we have the first and the second. All right. But a, a story developed. I just said to you, how could Innocent ever have given them approval? In fact, he had had a disastrous experience with a comparable group in France who went out and ended up in heresy and would be most likely to say no. Well, the story has said that the night before the meeting, the Pope had a dream. And I love this. It's so humorous. The Pope is sleeping with his tiara and all his robes and so forth. But we've got to know it's the Pope, all right? So there's the Pope, fully dressed, having a, having a dream. And in the dream, he saw his basilica, St. John Lateran, collapsing, and a young man holding it up and preventing it from collapsing. Of course, it's Francis. And Francis is here depicted in his habit. This is the dream of Innocent, that the church was collapsing, as represented by the Basilica of St. John Lateran, and this man, strange man, was preventing it. So the next morning, uh, he probably says, what's on my schedule? Uh, you have this group to meet. And when Francis walks in, it's the man from the dream. Now that's a way of explaining, okay? And remember, in the Jewish scriptures and then into the New Testament, God spoke to people through dreams. Going way back, the earliest stories, down into the New Testament, Joseph and others, dreams are a means of communication by God. So it's a wonderful story. This is not the first time it's depicted, but it's depicted as a wonderful architectural setting of God's provision. What I love, the little detail that he puts here, this absolutely wonderful grass and plants under his feet. That's the Renaissance. How to bring all of nature in. Something you wouldn't see in any of the others, beautifully framed. Incredible in perspective of the ceiling moving in. Here's an interesting story that's told that it seems to be out of nowhere. One of the questions that were often raised, I mentioned to you about the Dominicans, did St. Francis and St. Dominic ever meet? Well, we don't really know, but it's presumed that they met at the Fourth Lateran Council because they both attended it apparently separately, so they probably met. We don't know why this scene would be so important, but you know, you have a patron, and maybe the patron wanted this to be developed, and it's the meeting of St. Francis and St. Dominic in a beautiful setting, probably in front of the old St. Peter's Basilica in Rome, okay, at the Lateran Council. Here he's attended by a Franciscan and by a Dominican. But the meeting of St. Francis and St. Dominic, two of the major orders that emerged from this period in the mid-1200s, early 1200s, really. And then there's this little bizarre, if you will, and I could say that story that seems to make no sense at all, but it explains this. We have St. Dominic having a vision of Christ who has an arrow, and he's about to cast the arrow down. And this is the story that's told. St. Dominic had a vision, or a dream, in which he saw Christ wanting to punish the human race for their sins. Well, this is an often told story in the Old Testament of God the Father, who at a certain point is disappointed in the conduct of people and is considering punishment. But the prophet always intervenes, and God always relents in his mercy. So in this vision, the same thing happens. Christ is now ready to meet some punishment. Dominic begs him not to, and he doesn't. But the story is told that Francis had the same vision of Christ, wanting to strike the human race with punishments, and he begged the Lord not to, and he didn't. And what is said is, when they met, the first thing they talked about, each said, I heard you had that dream. Well, I had the same one. Now, this is very interesting. Compared to the scenes we've been looking at, this is sort of an oddity, something from the side. But it brings in history. There are two important saints emerging, two important orders with different missions, and people are wondering about all of these things. I'm sure it represents the fact, we must never forget, you have the artist, you have the religious in the church, and you have the sponsor. And the sponsor sometimes has a say, I'd like a scene of St. Saint, Saint Dominic because whatever. And there it is, and there it appears. The famous scene of Greccio. All of us who know the Christmas manger, the crib, and all of that, it's said that in 1224, Francis, two years before his death, created the first Christmas crib in the town of Greccio. He was at midnight mass, and by plan, he had decided to bring in a live donkey and a live ox and to put in a crib a doll of a baby. There are different versions of this, but it was not a tableau vivant. It was a live, don a live donkey, a live ox, 
and a baby. And we have it depicted very often in art. And here, the depiction as well, you see the masses going on. We see Francis with the doll, but we see the animals. And this is the first historical depiction, creation, if you will, of the Christmas crib, which we all know everywhere and, and so forth, and it developed beyond it. Historically, 1224, midnight mass in the town of Greccio. Now, there are two things to comment on here. First of all, how much this reveals Francis' spirituality, but also his respect for art. He saw that people needed concrete images in order to enter more deeply into the spiritual reality of the birth of Christ. It was something we would say was very obvious. So let's help them by bringing some images, actual animals and the baby, because if it's incarnational, if Christ is plunged into human time and human flesh, then the artist will plunge into the things of this earth, like clay and wood and so forth, and create things that will not leave us at the earth, but raise us spiritually. It's, it's a philosophy of art, and it's why the Franciscans consistently had their churches decorated in this way very far from the iconoclasts, all right? We have to avoid the image, not at all. So this is an important moment because it's incarnational and it suggests that all of creation is good, including the stuff of this earth, and the artist is able to do this to bring us to another place. So it's a very important scene. We also see some interesting historical things. We see one of the first depictions of a priest saying mass facing the wall, okay? He's turned back to watch it. We see the fact that some laymen could be in, admitted behind the altar screen. The presence of these women would be factually incorrect. This would not happen. They would not be there, but he balances it out. What fascinates me is this orgy of beautiful architectural form, all mixed in the background. We have the structure of a Gothic church, but between it we have Renaissance pilasters, Renaissance bullseyes, windows up above, and just it's sort of... a, a a melange of beautiful architecture that leads us into the scene. Earlier depictions were very, very simple. So the eye almost doesn't know where to go. And then just to bring it down to reality, this beautiful heartwarming moment, this child is quite terrified by the entire thing and is running to her mother for protection because she's just sort of breaking out in tears. She finds the whole thing a little frightening, including St. Francis. And so that reality, that bringing these high spiritual things down to the day-to-day -day reality, which was typical of the art depicting St. Francis from the very beginning. We're near the end, but I'll be able to introduce and show you just a few images of the third and last series of the 1400s by Domenico Ghirlandaio. You see a little more mature now. His life brings us just to, and he's contemporary with Leonardo da Vinci, at least with the um, well, the mid-career of Leonardo, 1449 to 1494, but now we go to Florence, to the Church of Santa Trinita. I've known many people who went through Florence and there was so much to see, they never got to Santa Trinita to see one of the great Renaissance. So when you go, you must go to see this great Renaissance cycle on St. Francis of Assisi. Here's Santa Trinita today with its Renaissance, later uh, facade, these are a series of frescoes in a chapel called the Sassetti Chapel. Not Sassetta, but Sassetti. Sassetti was a banker for the Medici, very well to do. And he had his own chapel, not only at, uh, in this church, but at uh, Santa Maria Novella. And he commissions uh, Ghirlandaio to create, you see, only a, a very small number. Ghirlandaio doesn't pack it the way uh, we just saw. He takes one single panel in about eight of them and avoids that. There's Sassetti on the right. If you look back, Sassetti, the donor on one side and his wife, Nira, on the other, and they're buried in the walls on each side. They, they paid for this chapel and they paid for its decoration. And here we have the first scene, all right, uh, very typical again. Francis uh, in his nudity being received by the, by the Pope. Um, why now completely new, nude? Well, we're in the Renaissance. We have to develop that, that body very much in a little bit like Verrocchio's uh, David, you know, kind of the, the developing uh, adolescent body. But the Renaissance artist wants to include everything, not just the nature and the cityscape, but the form. By the way, he puts in the back, scholars debate, is that Lyon or is that Geneva? But it's certainly not Assisi and it's not Rome. And the reason is Sassetti had banking business both in Lyon and in Geneva. And we're going to see the introduction more of the patrons. 
I'll probably end with this one, but this will equip you to look at the others. We have here the depiction of Francis receiving the rule, you know, receiving the order, being received by the Pope. And there you see the Pope, and there you see Francis, and if you look, you see the various Franciscans. We have almost a, a representation of the College of Cardinals. But isn't it true that it's almost lost in the profusion of figures in the front and the architecture in the back? Because what Ghirlandaio has done, although this is Rome, right? Francis had to go to Rome to meet the Pope. This is the new Rome. It's Florence. And when you look out of the windows or the portico of what's supposed to be St. John Lateran, we're standing right in front of the Palazzo Vecchio in Florence. We're looking at the loggia. This is Florence. This is for a Florentine church, for a Florentine banker. And he has enculturated it to a degree that he really says, well, you know, this is the new Rome. By the way, we get to see things that in, in 1470, they didn't have the David yet. It hadn't been created. They had not yet placed sculptures into the loggia. And so we're seeing the piazza in front of the Palazzo Vecchio as it was in those days. It's an interesting view. But what we have in the front is absolutely fascinating. We have Sassetti here with his youngest son pointing to his older sons over here. So they've all been brought into the story. Sassetti, the sponsor, his youngest son, his older sons, and who's standing next to him with the black hair? Lorenzo the Magnificent, Medici. Lorenzo the Magnificent. And he's with one of the family tutors, and who's coming up the stairs but his children? Oh, by the way, there you see Sassetti with his son, and here Lorenzo the Magnificent. And they're all attending the scene of St. Francis centuries later. And who are coming up the stairs? We have Giuliano, we have Piero, we have three sons, two of them looking right out at us and the rest of them attended by the, um, by the tutors coming right up. The family has been in included and we have there the future Pope Leo X. The question I would end with is, and I would like more time, by the way, look at that nice close detail of, as we look out on Florence. How does enculturation work? And I would end with this question. Is it a distraction or does it add something? I would say visually here, I almost have trouble keeping my eyes on St. Francis and the basic story. I'm so fascinated by Florence as it was in the mid 1400s and by the Medici family. And by the way, scholars will tell you these are the best portraits of the Medici because when Botticelli painted them, he idealized them. Even the men, he gave a little nip and a tuck here and there to make them look better. These are what they really look like. Now, enculturation means that this might speak in a new way to people who are Florentine because you now have Francis enculturated into that society. The other side is you've lost the historical reality and you get so focused on the local figures. My opinion is most people paid little attention to the Medici and the average person looking probably had never met them or seen them. They enjoyed seeing this story told in Renaissance context because this was their world. But in the end, their eyes came back to the story which dominated. But do you see how each of these artists in the 1400s took an approach totally different? The first, going back to a more antique style from Siena, delighting the eye and being comfortable doing it. The second in the typical developing Renaissance perspective and forms. And the third with an enculturation that is interesting and absolutely challenging to getting at the historical Francis. I will just end by pointing this out, and I want to have time for questions. When these three stories are over, when we come into the 1600s, and I just want to equip your looking, from this point on, these great cycles end. The churches have been decorated with their frescoes. The altar panel is out of date. It's no longer done. And we begin to have, for more than a century, oil paintings on canvas, which is the new medium of just St. Francis, almost always in mystical prayer. This Caravaggio, very early Caravaggio, now I'll give you the date of it, specific date, oil on campus, 1595. 
is an example, something totally different. And if you will look at Francis through the 1600s, this is what interests artists now. Francis in his mystical life. Because you know something in all those scenes, what fed all of that activity? What about the prayer life? It's the 1600s that examines that. Remember, we have now the emergence of the mystical saints, St. Saint John of the Cross, St. Teresa of Avila. We have the emergence of new spiritualities, three figures that encourage personal spiritual experience, St. Ignatius of Loyola, St. Philip Neri, and others who begin to suggest, and St. Francis de Sales with his introduction to the devout life, who begins to suggest that you and I, average people, can have a personal experience of God, and the art reflects it. Because in the end, art is always not only a commentary on the subject, but a reflection of the age in which the artist and the people live. In many ways, a far more reliable record than the best efforts of our historians, who often part of the era are simply too involved with the story. Thank you very much.